We're going to read from 2 Samuel chapter number 3. And let's all stand to our feet for the reading of God's word. 2 Samuel chapter number 3, verses 22 through 27. <clears throat> and I will read the even-numbered verses alone. Please join me in the reading of the odd-numbered verses, uh, which are highlighted in green here, 23, 25, and 27. All right, so I will start with verse 22. The Bible says, And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. When Joab and all the hosts that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Ner came to the king, and he hath sent him away, and he is gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What hast thou done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away? And he is quite gone. Thou knowest Abner, the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee and to know thy going out and thy coming in and to know all that thou doest. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, <clears throat> which brought him again from the well of Sirah. But David knew it not. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Azahel, his brother. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible and we pray that you would please bless this time now, the most important time of the service, the preaching of your word. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit's power and presence. And, and in fact, this entire room and each and every heart, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us now through your word, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so uh, just to kind of recap here, David is now made king of Judah. There's kind of a, a somewhat of a civil war in Israel where Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, was made king by the, uh, the, the people and uh, mainly led by Abner, who was the captain of Saul's armies, who survived the war with the Philistines. <clears throat> and uh, Ishbosheth is now king. <clears throat> but the tribe of Judah went to David and said, No, 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 David, you are our king. And so they kind of rejected Ishbosheth, made David the king. And so it's kind of split. And uh, there's been a civil war, but the house of David, because of God's blessing, is growing stronger and stronger. And the house of Saul, led by Ishbosheth, is getting weaker and weaker. And so Abner realizes, man, I'm on the wrong side. Clearly, because Abner is a righteous man. He was a good man. Maybe not perfect, but he was a good man. Certainly a God-fearing man. And he re re realizes, man, David's the good guy here. And God has obviously chosen David over the house of Saul. What am I doing? And so Abner abdicated, <laughs> you know, somewhat. And, and, and Abner uh, had plotted to, to kind of have a smooth transition for the people to accept David. Abner didn't want to destroy the house of Saul, uh, you know, because, you know, Abner was a good man. But he wanted to turn public opinion and, and, and because he knew that David was the rightful king. He could see it. He was losing all the battles and, and you know, David was, uh, uh, Joab was winning. <coughs> so he did that. And then he actually went to David personally and spoke to David and, and said, David, I know you're the, you're, you're the rightful king and I, I wanna, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to turn the opinion, public opinion of the nation of Israel so that they will accept you to be king. David said, hey, well, you know, that's, that's, that's great. That's fine. You know, if you want to do that. You know, that, that's, that's between you and God. And, you know, and, and so they, they had a, a good conversation. David sent Abner away in peace because David had respect for Abner. And then Joab showed up. After their meeting, King David and, and Abner, and, and uh, captain of the guard, after David sent Abner away, Joab comes late. And he just missed Abner. <clears throat> and Joab finds out. The, the, his men told him, hey, Abner was just here, man. And Joab was angry. You see, earlier, 
they had gotten in a skirmish and Joab's brother, Azahel, okay, Azahel, uh, was, was chasing after Abner. <clears throat> and, and Abner told him, hey, stop chasing me, man. I'm going to kill you. I'm, 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 I'm a better fighter than you. It's like, you need, I, you know, I, how am I supposed to face your brother Joab after, if, if I have to take your life? Turn around, Azael, run away. But a- Azael was a fast runner. And he, he, he just, Abner couldn't shake him. And Azael kept trying to, you know, kill him and, and slice at him and attack him. And, 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 and despite Abner's warning, Azael did not back up, did not relent. And so Abner killed him with a, with a spear, with the back of the spear, in fact. Very violent, very brutal pierced him not with the pointy side with the blunt side that's how strong Abner is okay killed Joab's brother Joab never forgot that all right and remember Joab is not exactly a man of character Joab is not a good person okay (coughs) and so Joab finds out Joab makes up this story there's no evidence of this. In fact, the Bible is very clear. Abner was a good man. Abner truly did want to make David king. But look at verse uh, uh, 25. This is Joab speaking now. Thou knowest Abner, the son of Ner, that, uh, or Ner, 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 I don't know, <coughs> uh, that he came to deceive thee and to know thy going out and thy coming. And he made up the story. He's like, man, Abner's smiling on you. No, he's not, Joab. You know that, Joab. David knows that. David definitely. This is the captain of the guard. But, da- but he's also David's relative. Okay, he's like a, he's like a distant cousin. Uh, and, and, and so David knows Joab. And so even David, like, just disregarded. Didn't even let, okay, okay, Joab. All right, listen, I know he killed your brother. Settle down. You know, David didn't even get, pay him any regard because David knows that Joab is not exactly an honest man. And then we see later on just how dishonest he is. Joab secretly calls for Abner to come back. Hey, 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 David wants to talk to you. Abner, come back. Lies. And he didn't tell David. So Abner comes back and Joab approaches him, stabs him with his sword under the fifth rib and kills him, murders him. Okay, murders him, which later on, in his old age, unfortunately, it, 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 was, it was a delayed justice. But later on, Job does end up paying for this murder with his life uh, at the hands of King Solomon. But anyway, <clears throat> um, Joab, a sneaky and a violent man, now murders Abner, a man more righteous than he, an innocent man, all under David's nose. <clears throat> Now, Joab was promoted by David. David was the one that picked Joab to be captain of the guard. All right. And even after this murder, unfortunately, there was no no justice right away. Joab remained captain of the guard and, and remained a sneaky man. Okay. Like constantly undermining David. Number one, one lesson we can learn is beware of sneaky people. Beware of sneaky people. You know, David should have fired Joab right there on the spot. I don't care what kind of soldier he is. He lacks character. He should have been fired because he causes trouble for David again in the future. It's not not the only time. And then not only that, it was Joab that killed David's son, Absalom against his wishes and then later on in David's old age does Joab remain loyal because you would think well maybe it's just because Joab's you know just so fiercely loyal to David no he's not because later on he betrays David and 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 goes with one of David's sons who proclaimed himself to be king and 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 completely abandons David in David's old age Joab is a sneaky self-serving man and, and it was a mistake for David to keep him on. A mistake that David would have to pay for again and again. He should have brought justice to the murderer of Abner. Because even David, we'll look at later on here, even David acknowledged 
that Abner was, was, was a good man, a righteous man, more righteous than Joab. And David even cursed Joab for killing Abner, but he didn't fire him. Huge mistake. Huge mistake. Beware of sneaky people. You know, when Jesus chose the 12, it was prophesied that one of them would have to betray him, right? So who did Jesus choose? Judas Iscariot, a sneaky guy. You could always count on sneaky people to betray you. <laughs> you could always count on sneaky people to cause harm to the people around them. Because sneaky people cannot be trusted. They just can't. You know, as believers, we are supposed to be children of the light. What does the light do? It exposes, right? It's truth. It brings, but the Bible says that men love darkness. Why? Because they can sleep better? <laughs> no. Why do men love darkness? Because their deeds are evil. evil. Exactly. The cover of night. Nobody can see me do what I'm doing. Sneaky. Sneaky. Sneakiness is something that we must be aware of. And we already saw signs in Judas, right? When he said, Lord, why, why, why is she pouring that oil? We could have sold it and given to the poor. And Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus already knew. Like, you wouldn't have given the money to the poor. You would have kept it for yourself, you greedy dog. He's, you know, he's a liar. He's sneaky. He was greedy. Right? <clears throat> sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. <clears throat> Benedict Arnold, a name that uh, many of you I'm sure are familiar with, he betrayed the, uh, uh, the United States during the Revolutionary War. Benedict Arnold was a sneaky guy. He was constantly disobeying orders. He was having run-ins with his superiors because he would be told to do one thing and he would do his own thing because he was seeking glory for himself. Benedict Arnold was a very egotistical man, a very self-serving man, which is why he had, he had no problem at all betraying his country. <clears throat> and all he was seeking was public glory and recognition. In fact, that's, that's the whole reason why he was upset and betrayed his country, because he didn't get the promotion that he deserved. It's Benedict Arnold. He betrayed his country. Think about that. Because he didn't get promoted. He didn't get recognized. And when he was caught and he fled to England and was able to successfully get away uh, before he was hanged as a traitor, he went to England and, and was, you know, welcomed by the people there, you know, because he sided with them, right? And a lot of people don't know this, but in England, I forgot what city, maybe in London, I can't remember exactly, but they built a statue of Benedict Arnold because over there he's a hero, right? But you know what, folks? That still wasn't good enough for Benedict Arnold because he, he, uh, uh, he expressed, even after moving to England, that he didn't get enough recognition for what he did for the royalists. This guy is a sneaky, self-serving traitor to the United States. But that's typically how sneaky people are, and we must beware of... of, of <clears throat> Allowing sneaky people to be involved in our lives and, and decision-making uh, in our lives especially. And I want to especially talk to the younger kids here. There's only one kid here. I don't know where I'm, oh, yeah, there's some kids up there. Teens, kids, everywhere. I want, I want to warn you especially, okay? <clears throat> if a friend or a teacher or an adult, anybody at all, comes to you, kids, and says, this is our little secret. Don't tell your parents. Beware. Beware. Never trust a sneaky person. And if they, tell, if they tell you, don't tell your parents, first thing you need to do is tell your parents. First thing. Okay? And then you stay away from that sneaky person. You stay away from people who tell you, to keep secrets from your parents. Understand that, kids? Now, for adults, a little higher level here, similar warning. 
beware of gossip because that is one of the uh, ways that sneakiness can infiltrate into your life is by bashing other people. Beware of gossip. Gossiping is sneaky. Therefore, beware of gossipy people. Okay? <clears throat> the Bible gives us a very clear formula that if you have a problem with someone, you go to them directly. You just, you, you, you go to the, they have to know. That is how you resolve problems. Okay? And sometimes the solution may be just part ways. Okay, that's a solution. Uh, you know, if, if there's no reconciliation, uh, you know, but, but nevertheless, instead of going directly to that person you have a problem with, you go to everybody else instead and try to sway them to take your side and, and gossip. And that's not, that's not the right way. That's not the biblical way. And, and we must be careful of people like that. Let me tell you, whether that's in church, at work, uh, social friendship circles, it doesn't matter where it is. If somebody is trying to get close to you and they are that kind of person, beware. Beware. Because if they will bash someone else to you, they will bash you to someone else. That's how gossips work. There is no loyalty with sneaky people. Ever. None. And so, <clears throat> don't be fooled by their sneakiness. Sneaky people are not your friends. They're a danger. They are a danger to you. Beware of them. Next, 2 Samuel chapter 3, starting with verse 28. It says, And afterward, when David heard it, now David heard about the murder. He said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord <coughs> forever from the blood of Abner, <coughs> excuse me, the son of Ner. Let it rest on the head of Joab and on all his father's house and let there not fail from the house of Joab one that hath an issue or that is a leper or that leaneth on a staff or that falleth on the sword or that lacketh bread. Look at that. He basically cursed Joab and his lineage, you know, said some very strong words here against Joab because he knows that Abner was right. Joab was wrong for what he did. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, slew Abner because he had slain their brother Azael. It was just a revenge murder. That's all it was uh, at Gibeon in the battle. And David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, rend your clothes and gird you with sackcloth and mourn for Abner, uh, before Abner, and King David himself followed the bear. And they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. So, a couple things here. One, you, you can see that David wept for Abner. Made it very public that he was not for this murder. It was Joab's doing. And, and he, he's trying to distance himself from it. But unfortunately... Because Joe, I don't know if it's because Joab was related to, to David or because Joab was just a, a very effective soldier out in the battlefield or effective commander out in the battlefield because he wins a lot of battles. I don't know what it was, but David was a, in this particular case made the mistake of being a respecter of persons. And he may have said all these strong words, but he never fired Joab. Ne Joab didn't suffer any consequences at all continued being in charge of the, of the army, of the armies of David. Mistake on David's part that we can learn from. Because again, David pays for it later, okay? With the life of his own son, Absalom. Number two, don't be a respecter of persons. Don't be a respecter of persons. There is never a reason to favor evil or to favor wrongdoing if somebody did wrong it must be called out if somebody did evil you cannot just brush that you know under the rug and pretend it never happened because well i like this guy you know he's he's my you know my cousin my brother whatever okay listen if i do wrong if I, if, I, 
if, if, if I get caught in adultery or something like that, you know, or, or, or uh, folks, fire me, please. It's the biblical thing to do. Oh, but pastor, you've done this for us. I don't care. Do not be a respecter of persons. Live on principle. You could still, you know, if I do anything, you know, be my friend and help me to get back to, to a righteous life and make things right. And of course, I'm not saying abandon people, but you never allow evil. That should never be named among us as believers. We are not people who are accepting of evil works. We, we, we should be a people as followers of Christ who promote good works, who promote righteousness. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but it does mean that we, we are children of the light. He is the light. And we must promote the light. We must promote His righteousness. His righteousness. No matter what. Do not be a respecter of persons. Be a respecter of God. We are Christians. Not Nanjanites or, or, you know, whoever, you know, uh, was it Stephen Furtick, Furtickites? Oh, sorry. Sounded like I cursed. <clears throat> uh, Warrenites, you know, Rick Warren. Like, we, we, don't, we don't follow men. We follow Christ. Always. He is our guide. He is our compass. <laughs> the Word of God is our standard. And so do not be a respecter of persons. And unfortunately, David made a huge mistake here by keeping Joab on. He should have fired him. He should have made him pay for his crime. Because what Joab did was, was it was a crime because it was against the law to, to murder. But also it was, it, was, it was a moral crime against God. And David knew it. How do we know David knew it? Because David told his son Solomon. That's how we know it. Years later, he passed the buck. Huge mistake. Because David was too weak to confront Joab. He didn't have the fortitude to confront Joab, his cousin, and his captain. So what does he do? In his old age, years and years later, he has his son do it. Hey, Solomon, you know what your uncle Joab did. He killed Abner, a righteous man. He's got to pay for that. So Solomon had to do the, you know, the, 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 the righteous uh, deed of, of bringing justice to the blood of Abner, to his uncle Joab. That's not right. We should never be a respecter of persons. Be a respecter of God. Now, real quick, before I move on, again, I want to emphasize, that doesn't mean that we treat people coldly and harshly. You do everything out of love. That's, that's biblical. Biblical. Everything should be a foundation of love. But righteousness and, 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 and the word of God should never be comp compromised. Because honestly, that's no longer love. <laughs> when, the, when, when the law of God is compromised, uh, then the love of God is compromised. All right? That's, that's, that, that, that's a fact. I, I don't let my kids do whatever they want because I love them. No, I have strict rules for them because I love them. They go hand in hand, you see. The law of God and the love of God go hand in hand. They do not oppose each other. They complete each other. Okay? Next, 2 Samuel 3, verses 33 through 39. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth? Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put into fetters, as a man falleth before wicked men. Look at that. So fellest thou. Basically acknowledging that Joab and his brother Abishai were wicked men for doing this, for murdering Abner. So fellest thou. And all the people wept again over him. And when all the people came to cause David to eat meat with, uh, while it was yet day, David swore, saying, So do God to me and more also, if I taste bread or aught else till the sun be down. So David fasted for the rest of the, of the daylight to show to the, to the people of Israel how much he respected Abner and how much he was against the murder of Abner. And all the people took notice of it and it pleased them. 
as whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people and all Israel understood that day that it was not of the king to slay Abner, the son of Ner. And the king said unto his servants, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? This is what David called Abner, a prince and a great man. Verse 39, And I am this day weak, though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zeruiah, that's, that's Joab and Abishai, their father's name is Zeruiah, uh, be too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. So you can see that David publicly honored Abner. Number three, give honor to whom honor is due. Give honor to whom honor is due. <clears throat> you know, a, a sneaky person will not do that. A sneaky person only seeks to honor themselves. And, and self-serving people seek to do the same thing. They, they only want to promote themselves. They only want to, uh, you know, but as believers, we ought to give honor to whom honor is due. Uh, this is the difference, I think, between Satan's tactics <coughs> Excuse me, and, and, and the method of, of Jesus Christ. When the Lord Jesus Christ had died on the cross, rose again, and created this new era for now over 2,000 years, that is what is known as the church age, right? Because he created, Jesus created the church, right? <clears throat> I, I want to contrast here the difference between Jesus' method. Okay, Satan loves the whole thing of stardom. Okay, lifting up a person to be a star, and then everybody listens to that person. That's 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 a very uh, it's actually a very satanic method, because first of all, a movie star, a a a music star, or whatever a celebrity, you realize that the word star can also refer to angels. In the Bible. And that's, that's what Lucifer was. Right? He was an angel. And, and, uh, and so the whole concept of, of being a star. It's very Luciferian. When you look at a lot of, of um, pagan. Old ancient pagan religions. They always talk about the stars talking to them, the stars coming down. And, and uh, you know, it's, 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 I mean, it goes, it goes back many, many years to the ancient days, okay, of, of promoting stars. And so, so the whole concept of, of desiring to be a movie star and all of that, um, it's a very Luciferian concept, you know, uh, about lifting. I mean, that, that was what Satan said, that was what Lucifer said. When he saw the glory of God, he said, ooh, you know what? I will be like the most high. I will be lifted. I, me, 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 me. And so when you have that kind of culture now, you see that in America, it's very satanic. And now it's creeping into the churches. Oh, look at that. That I mean, look, look at that pastor, man. That, pa that pastor's a rock star. Oh, man, I hate that term. Folks, don't ever call me a rock star, please. You know, oh man, you're, you're a rock star for what you did. Why in the world would I want to emulate the wickedness of the world? I don't want to be a rock star. I want to be a servant that will someday hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. From him! I'm sorry, I love you guys, but not from you. From him. I only want to hear it from him. Which means, for those, for those who truly want that, then we must make like John the Baptist, who said, I must decrease, and he must increase. Oh, if the church in America, the churches in America, would just grasp that concept instead of always constantly trying to be stinking rock stars, revival would break out. In America but we're obsessed with the limelight why because Satan has taken over and his concept has taken over look at the establishment of the church there is no rock star position in the church 
There's none. Because the church is a body of people, not a rock star. God didn't say, I choose one man to lead us all, all the time. There's always going to be one apostle. There's always going to be one king. There's going to, no. He chose a body of people to serve. Oftentimes, anonymously. That's the difference, right? And so, we ought to be perfectly comfortable with giving honor to whom honor is due. See, Abner was fighting on the other side. Why would David honor Abner? Because David loved the Lord. And he's a righteous man. And he recognized that Abner was a righteous man. And so, as believers... We must, this, this must be a, a, a common practice for us to give honor to whom honor is due. When someone does something right, give them the honor that's due to them. Moving on, David answered, recap and, okay, so before we get to that actually, there's some backstory here, okay? There's a lot of verses to read, so there's too many to read. So I'll just, I'll just summarize it for you. So when Abner died, Ish-bosheth, who was Saul's son and the current king, he was scared. In fact, the Bible says his, his hands were, were feeble because he was so scared because now his captain had died. What's he going to do? And so he laid in bed one night and two of his captains, Rechab, Rechab and Bana, snuck into his chamber and murdered him in his bed and then chopped off his head and snuck away into the night. Sneaky people, sneaky people, which cost Ishbosheth his life by allowing sneaky people to be his captains. R snuck out into the night with the head of Ishbosheth to deliver to David. So now we come upon these verses. And they came to David and they said, We have killed your enemy, David, Ish King Ishbosheth, who sought thy life, thinking that they would be rewarded. Verse 9 here, 2 Samuel chapter 4. And David answered Rechab and Bana, his brother, the sons of Rimon, the Berothite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity. When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings. Remember the, uh, the, the uh, Ammonite? Is it Ammonite? No. The Amalekite, sorry. The Amalekite. I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. How much more? When wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed, shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men and they slew them and cut off their hands and their feet, who brutal, and hang them upon the pool in Hebron, making a public example of these guys. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. Once again, David shows what a principled and righteous man he is. Because Ishbosheth was indeed his rival. Ishbosheth was the, was the only one left that was preventing David from truly being the king of Israel. But David was such an honorable man and a righteous man. That he didn't want to kill Ishbosheth. And in fact, when, when two guys did kill Ishbosheth, he brought justice to Ishbosheth by executing the, these murderers. Number four, never sacrifice your honor for self gain. Never, ever, 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 ever sacrifice your honor for self gain. However much money it is, or promotion, or, or, or prestige, or power, or influence on social media, or whatever, none of that is ever worth your honor before God. And I should clarify that. Your honor before the Lord, before the eyes of the Lord. None of it is ever worth that. Rechab and Bana chose self-gain. David chose honor. When we were in the... Uh, Lake Forest location before. You know, we wanted to always be 
righteous before our landlord and do the right thing. And we paid our rent. The Gospel Light Baptist Church always paid the rent on time. The, a couple times, you know, we had, we had set up an automated uh, way to, to send the check uh, to our landlord, but the bank messed up. And after it happened the second time, uh, you know, we apologized, switched banks because it was, it was important for us to maintain our integrity, uh, you know, before. And then from there, it was just smooth, it was auto, you know, automatic and always got paid on time. And then finally, fast forward five years later, COVID hits, our church shrunk, we didn't, uh, the Shens moved <laughs> to Texas and, you know, our, our bank account as a church was dwindling and uh, I knew, and I saw the writing on the wall and so I didn't ever want to, to put him in a predicament. So we, so I gave him, you know, plenty of heads up. I said, hey, we, we, we'll pay, you know, I'll, I'll give you two months notice so you have plenty of time to find another uh, another tenant if you need to I said but I don't think we'll be able to to afford the rent after a couple months you know and and uh, I said I'm so sorry man I know your business is struggling too you know because COVID hit everybody you know including his business and he said you know what man you guys have just been such a blessing to us and you've uh, to me and, and he was a one-man show he was just so owner of the business and he said, you, you know, you've, you've always, always, you know, paid on time and, uh, you know, you, you took care of the property. You know, we always, always kept everything. And then, and in fact, we'd even clean up his stuff downstairs sometimes. And, and, you know, we just wanted to be good tenants. He said, uh, you know what, man, just stay for free as long as you need to. Don't even worry about it. Figure something out. You know, <clears throat> We were able to do that because we maintained our honor, because we did the right thing. You know, it ha had we compromised our integrity, that would have been quite a, you know, we, we would have had a very, very different outcome for sure. You know, those who chase self-gain will only find loss. They'll only find loss. Constantly looking how they can make a buck, how they can gain, you know, here and there and, 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 and sacrificing their honor and integrity for self-gain. They will find the opposite. They will only find loss. You know what the Bible term for greedy is? There's, there's actually a Bible term which many people may not know. It's evil eye. Somebody who has an evil eye is greedy. Proverbs 28, 22 says, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. You see the irony there? Somebody who is desperate to be rich and will do anything to, to be rich, including compromising their integrity and their honor, they will find the opposite. They will find poverty. Somebody who's greedy. But Proverbs 22, 9 says, He that hath a bountiful eye, that's a generous person. So an evil eye, biblically speaking, in Bible language, an evil eye is a greedy person. A bountiful eye is a generous person. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, finding favor from God. For he giveth of his bread to the poor. Not selleth, giveth, <laughs> right? He giveth of his bread to the poor, bountiful I. Never sacrifice your honor for self-gain. A dishonorable man takes and takes and takes, but an honorable, an honorable man gives and gives and gives. It was Paul who said, I will gladly spend and be spent for you. Now, if that wasn't incredible enough, he goes on to say that I know that the more I love, the less I am loved. And guess what? He did it anyway. Knowing that, you know what? I know that the more I love you, the less you love me. That's okay. I'm just going to keep loving you. That's what honorable people do. They give and they give. Yes, sometimes even to thieves who take it and run away and steal. It's okay. 
honorable man will give, but a dishonorable man will take and be sneaky and take and take and take some more. <clears throat> and you know, there's there's actually a passage which I didn't put the verses up here, but you can read it in, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse number 4. It's very interesting to me that in the middle of telling this story about Rechab and Bana and Ishbosheth, there was a person that was mentioned in one verse, really brief, and it almost seems like that was kind of weird. Why did they put him in this story real quick? And that is 2 Samuel. Uh, chapter 9, verse 4. And um, it's a verse 4. Yeah, well, anyway, the person that's mentioned is Mephibosheth. That's Ishbosheth's brother. Mephibosheth, I'm sorry, not brother, nephew. Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son. Okay? Mephibosheth, when he was five years old, they found out that Saul and his sons were all killed in battle. And the Bible says that the, uh, the nurse of little five-year-old Mephibosheth took him and ran and tried to run away. And in the process of running away, he got injured permanently and he became lame in his legs. I don't know if he fell down a flight of stairs or what, broke his legs. Or, but but he, he, was, he was basically like a, like a, you know, just lame, handicapped. He wasn't able to walk normally as everybody else because of this injury sustained when he was five years old. <clears throat> and so he was, you know, led a life of, of always needing assistance and, and help. And he was mentioned in the middle of Ishbosheth's story and being murdered by these two captains. You think, why, why did they, why did God slip in Mephibosheth real quick? And then I read the story about Mephibosheth and, and that, you know, what, what, what happened. And it dawned on me, wait a minute. When the Philistines went to battle with Saul and the armies of Israel, they never invaded Israel. Like they fought and then they left. They went home. Like there was no, no approaching army in the capital. So why was the nurse so afraid? Why did the nurse grab Mephibosheth to run for their lives? Who were they running from? It wasn't the Philistines. There are no Philistines there. There was no encampment. There was no approaching army. Who were they running for? From? And it dawned on me. His own family. Because his dad, Jonathan was the crown prince, which means he was in line to be king, which means if there were other relatives like Ishbosheth, I'm not saying Ishbosheth would have done it, but that's the thought process, that his life would have been in danger for those who were ambitious to be the next king. He was running from his own family. It's kind of crazy. And became lame. <clears throat> And you know who took him in? David. David took him in. So that he lived in the palace with David and, and he ate with David at his table. Took care of Jonathan's son. Because David, what did he have to gain from Mephibosheth? A, a guy who, could, who couldn't even walk anymore because he was handicapped now for the rest of his life. A guy who could not fight on the battlefield. Who who was always needing help to take care of him. What could David possibly gain from Mephibosheth, you know, financially, uh, whatever, in any way? Nothing. But that's not why David did it. David did it because he was an honorable man. He didn't, he didn't do it for gain at all. He did it to honor Jonathan, his best friend, and the house of Saul. David took care of him. Never sacrifice your honor for self-gain. Lastly, my last point. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh also in time past. When Saul was, our, was king over us, thou wast he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain 
over Israel. Now, isn't that interesting? Now the nation of Israel comes before David. And look at what they're saying. Think about what, they're, what they just told him here, what we just read. David, even when Saul was king, we, knew, we loved you. You were a good captain when you were, when you were in and out of the people among us. You know, uh, uh, I mean, we, it was you that led our people. It was you that led us into victory. And we know that God has chosen you. We knew it all along, even when Saul was king. Well, you could have said something, <laughs> you know. But the people now are finally admitting it and saying it to his face and, and, and finally welcoming him as their king. So all the elders of Israel, verse 3, came to the king to Hebron and King, uh, and king David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel. Oh, finally! After so many years, made him king over Israel. Lastly, number five, don't, under, don't underestimate the importance of having a good reputation. Don't underestimate the importance of having a good reputation. Saul destroyed his reputation because of his greed and his emotional instability and, and terrible, terrible, self-serving decisions. <clears throat> but David, even though he was lied about, slandered, and put under the pressure, unjustly, by the way, from King Saul, the people of Israel knew better. They witnessed David maintain his integrity, maintain his honor. And that good reputation, finally, in the end, David didn't even have to go to battle. He didn't have to fight with Israel and say, I demand you make me king. He didn't have to do any of that. They came to him and said, please be our king, please. We know you're a righteous man. Be our king. Why? Because of his stellar reputation. Never underestimate the importance of having a good reputation. It is worth the effort to maintain a good reputation. Oh man, I want it. Oh, that makes me so angry. I want it, but I, oh, this is the right thing to do, but I really want to do this. It's worth the trouble of doing the right thing again and again and again. <clears throat> and even if the people don't remember he does. God always remembers. So don't ever underestimate the importance of a good reputation. It is worth every drop of sweat and blood and tears and effort to maintain, to build and maintain a good reputation. It's worth it. It's worth it in the end. Let's pray.